Hello, everyone. Let's see if we can talk about section 3.1, which is on identifying pairs of lines and angles. So uh, 3.1 is an introduction to chapter 3, which means we're going to have a lot of vocab that we're going to talk about. And as soon as we get that all nailed down, we'll be in great shape. We'll be pros. So uh, for our very first piece right here, our very first term is an oldie, but a goodie, and it's going to be parallel lines. Now, we have a definition for parallel lines right here that you are probably very com comfortable with. And it says that they are going to be lines that do not intersect. But I want to add a little bit onto that. So I'm going to add on the fact that parallel lines are also going to be coplanar. What this means is that they are going to be lines that are going to exist on the exact same plane. I have a picture right over here of some lines, and the plane that they live on is my piece of paper. And these lines right here are going to be going off in all kinds of different directions. But I do have a couple that are parallel, specifically AB here at the top, and then CD down here at the bottom. Those two lines are going to be parallel lines. Now, if I want to talk about those lines, I can use some notation to do that quickly and easily. I would talk about line AB by writing the letters and then drawing myself a small li uh, line over the top. I could talk about line CD by once again writing the letters and drawing the line. Now, if I want to talk about those two lines being parallel, all I need to do is just draw two parallel lines between them like that. If you want to mark your drawing and show that two lines are parallel on your drawing, you can do that quickly and easily by adding in some arrowheads. These arrowheads are going to go in the middle of your line, not on the very far right or on the very far left, not on the ends, but in the middle. That will signify two parallel lines. Let's move on to our second term. Our second term is skew lines. Now, skew lines are also going to be lines that do not intersect. So with that in mind, you might be wondering, if skew lines do not intersect, why do we even need them? Because isn't that the same thing that parallel lines are? And the difference here is that skew lines are going to be non-coplanar, which means they do not share the same plane, but rather they will each have their own separate plane. So I cannot show you skew lines in my first drawing right here because once again, all of these lines live on the plane that is my piece of paper. So I have another drawing right here and this one's got a perspective to it so you can see that there's some depth here. What I have is I have two crossroads. I was imagining when I was making this that this was gonna be Rochester Road and there would be a sign that said Rochester Road on it that would go in the same direction. Then I was imagining that this road right here could be Tinkin Road and there would be a sign that said Tinkin on it as well. Now the roads themselves certainly intersect right here and the signs intersect as well. So they are not gonna be skew. But if we choose one of our roads, like Rochester Road, but we choose the opposite road sign, the Tinkin Road sign, we will have two lines that are going in, in conflicting directions. But because the road sign is lifted off the ground, there is space between them and they will not intersect, even though they travel in two different directions. One of them is on the plane that is the ground and one of them is on a separate plane that is much higher. So it is the road and the opposite road sign that will be skew. Let's talk about pa parallel planes. Parallel planes are going to be planes that do not intersect. So when I was talking about that idea of the roads living on the plane of the ground and then the road signs living on a higher plane, those planes would be parallel. They would never intersect. They would be right next to each other, stacked on top of each other with air gap in between. Last piece, transversal. A transversal is a little bit different. If you take a look at all of the definitions we have so far, you'll notice that the term not intersect shows up. But a transversal is going to be a line and it will intersect. In fact, it will do it two or more times. Transversals are going to be some lines that are going to intersect. In our picture right over here, the street sign itself, this guy right here is a transversal. It will intersect the streets and it will intersect the street sign. So it is going to be a transversal that will intersect two times. Next, we have some postulates. Now, these postulates are going to be based off of parallel lines again and perpendicular lines. And this is just to help us when we are writing um, some proofs and kind of formalize our information. Last checkpoint we had, we had some proofs. And when we were filling in the reasons, we used definitions, but we also used theorems and postulates. If we have proofs in the future, which we will, these parallel postulate and this perpendicular postulate will help us with those proofs. And basically, the postulates just say that if you are trying to build parallel lines or uh, perpendicular lines, they are going to be unique. 
here is my example right here. If you already have a line and you have a point picked out and you want to build a parallel line, you don't have a lot of options. The only option that you have would be a line that looked like this. It would need to run right along next to the line you already have and it would need to pass through the point. And that would be your only parallel line. If you're trying to build perpendicular lines through a line and a point, once again, you have limited choices. Your line needs to go through the point, but it also needs to be 90 degrees to the line. And so that means you don't have that many options available to you. And so you only have one, one unique choice. Let's take a look at an example that's got another drawing. So this time we have a three dimensional figure. It's got a front and a back that are pentagons. And then it's got these sides that are rectangular and they're stretched between the front and back. What I want you to do is I want you to see if you can find some of these vocabulary terms in the picture itself. So our first piece is we're trying to find a line that is parallel to AF. AF runs along the very ridge of this uh, picture right here. It is going to be at the very top. And we want to choose a line that is parallel, but we also want it to include point E. Point E is going to be pretty critical in this problem, so I'm going to highlight it right here. Now, a line that is going to be parallel needs to make sure it does not intersect AF. And there are actually quite a few lines that are, in, are parallel to AF, but we want to pick one that is parallel and passes through point E. Some of the lines that extend from point E are going to run in an opposing direction to AF. Uh, and that is bad because that means that uh, they are not going to be on the same plane. Some of the lines like AE right here live on the same plane, but they are going to intersect at points like A. So we want to pick the perfect line that will live on the plane with AF, but not intersect AF. And EJ would be a great option. EJ is going to be my perfect answer right here. I'm going to mark it as a line using my notation. Now for skew lines, now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at BG. BG is this dotted line right here, and it's dotted because it's actually at the back of my drawing. I can't really see it because I can't really see through this three-dimensional solid, but I do know that it's back there, so I've drawn it in as a bit of an imaginary line. Now I want to pick a line that is going to be skewed to BG, and it's going to pass through point E again. Now remember, skew means does not intersect, but it also means lives on a different plane. So BG right here has got a couple of planes that are right next to it, one above it, one below it, and we can't use those. Luckily, E right over here is at the very front of our drawing, and so that is going to be living on some very different planes. A line segment that worked great for us last time was EJ, and EJ right here is certainly not going to intersect BG. But the thing about it is, though, that EJ does actually live on the same plane as BG. And you might be saying, which plane? And it's actually not drawn. So you would actually have to incorporate kind of an extra plane right here. And this plane would use your two parallel sides, BG and EJ. And you would see that there would be a plane that lived inside of the figure. That's not very good. We don't want that one. So EJ will not be used a second time. If we use a different line from E, like ED right here, ED is pacing in a completely different direction. It is shooting off in more of a vertical direction right here. And because of that, it is going to be on a complete and unique plane that is different from BG, which is kind of running more horizontally. So ED is a much better choice for us. Now, our last option that are, of a line that comes from E is going to be EA. Now, EA right here is an interesting one because it looks like it intersects BG right there. But that is actually inaccurate. It does not intersect each other because of their locations in the three-dimensional figure. This is a three-dimensional figure drawn on a two-dimensional piece of paper, so it looks like they're intersecting, but it's just not true. EA is at the very front while BG is on the side. So EA will be a second equally good answer. Now for our last piece right here, we want to talk about parallel planes. And our first plane that we want to discuss is F, G, H. Now the points F, G, and H all exist at the very far back of our drawing. And so the plane that we are going to be talking about is going to be the very back of this three-dimensional figure. It is a pentagon shape, and it is very, very, very far to the back. Now if we're going to choose a parallel plane, we want this plane to not intersect the yellow plane. And so that means it needs to be far away and it needs to use its own unique points. 
So um, I have lots of rectangular planes over here off to the side, but I noticed that all of the rectangular planes are going to butt up to my green or pentagon that I have here, so I don't want to use any of those rectangles. The pentagon at the very front of my drawing, however, uses all unique points. It doesn't use G or F or J or I or H. And it's going to run at the very front while our other uh, pentagon ran at the very back. They'll be right next to each other like bread on a sandwich. And then everything ha will be happening in between them. So that pentagon, that plane will be a much better choice. I'm going to choose to name this by starting at point E. And then I'm going to bounce my way around clockwise. So I'm going to call it E, D, C. You can call it other names if you'd want. Just use three letters, never any more or any less. And you're going to either go clockwise or counterclockwise around your figure, and then you can name your plane that way. All right, it is now your turn to do a little bit of practicing. What I have for you right here is a wedge-shaped three-dimensional figure, and I want you to see if you can find me some parallel skew, perpendicular, and parallel planes in this figure right here. Pause the video, and then try it on your own. And then I'll share my answers with you after that. Here are some final answers for you. Parallel to MN along the backside would be JL along the front. Skew lines for MN would be JK along the front. KO across this bottom edge and KL across the front bottom. Perpendicular would be JN, which goes across the very top, and MN that runs along the side right there. They'd form a 90 degree angle. And then lastly, a parallel plane would be JKL. JKL would be this triangle right at the front here, and it would be parallel to MNO at the back here, which is also triangular in shape, but formed by its own unique set of points. Next. Let's talk about our transversals again. So our transversals are going to be these lines that we have that are going to cut through two additional lines. Now transversals are interesting and unique and so geometric mathematicians are always interested in them. Though one of the reasons why they're interested in them is because transversals form these clusters of angles. And as geometric mathematicians were looking at these clusters, they noticed all kinds of patterns and unique pieces. And so they wanted to be able to talk about these clusters of angles. And that meant that they needed to come up with some terminology so that they could discuss, maybe by writing letters or publishing papers. So that's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about the angles that live in these clusters, and we're going to give them names. Let's talk about our first set. So I have two angles identified right here. I'm going to call it angle two and angle six for right now. And I want you to take a close look at how they're related to one another. Angle two in this little cluster is what I would call in the upper right hand corner. And angle six is in the upper right as well. You could also call this northeast and northeast. Now, because they are matching, they're both in the northeast, we would say that they match. But we're not going to use that simple term match. We're going to use a fancier word. And that fancier word is going to be they are going to correspond. And since we are using the fancy word correspond instead of the fancy word match, we call these corresponding angles. Angle four and angle five are going to be different. Angle four and angle five do not correspond. If I was going to describe angle four, I would say that it is in the lower right or in the southeast. Angle five is in the upper left or in the northwest. Those are different. And not only are they different, they're also opposites. Lower right, upper left, southeast, northwest. And since they are going to be complete opposites, we're going to want to use a fancy word that means opposite. The fancy word that we're going to use instead of opposite is going to be alternate. Here is another thing that mathematicians notice about angle four and five. Angle four and angle five are nestled very comfortably, very snugly in between our two intersected lines. We have a line over here and a line over here, and right between those two lines, we have our two angles that we're discussing. Since they are in between our two lines, we are going to call them interior angles as well. So they are not just alternate, but rather alternate interior. 
Angle one and angle eight, if I was gonna describe their locations, I might say upper left and lower right. I would say northwest and southeast. Now, just like we had talked about before, those terms are opposites, but we don't use the word opposite. We use a fancy version and we're gonna call it alternate. Unlike our last set though, angle one and angle eight are not nestled very comfortably and snugly in between our two lines. One is high above and eight is down below, up in the thin cold air and down in the cold damp soil. And so because these guys are outside of the snuggly warmth of the middle, we are gonna call them exterior angles. We have interiors up here, we're gonna have exteriors down here. Our last set that we have right here, angle three and angle five. Now these ones, if I was gonna describe them, I would say that this one is in the lower left and this one is in the upper left. Now I did use the word left both times. So they are not perfect opposites of each other, but they're also not the same. So we are gonna use a different word this time because they are right next to each other on the left side, we are gonna call them consecutive. These angles are also nestled very snugly and warmly in between our two intersected lines. So we will call them interior angles as well. We have four terms corresponding alternate interior, alternate exterior and consecutive interior angles. Let's see if we can talk about uh, some example problems. Right here, I have all eight of the angles labeled with numbers. And what we wanna do is we wanna identify the sets that are corresponding alternate interior, alternate exterior, and consecutive interior. For corresponding, I'm gonna be very boring and I'm gonna start with angle one. Now angle one's location is in the upper left or in the northwest. When I travel down to my second cluster of angles down at the bottom, I wanna find another angle that is in the upper left or the northwest. That would be angle five. Now this isn't the only set of corresponding angles. Let's do angle two. Angle two, I would describe as in the upper right or in the northeast. If I come down to my second cluster, I wanna to go to the upper right or the northeast and I will find angle six. Let's do angle three. Angle three, I would describe as being in the lower right-hand corner or in the southeast. Another angle that is in the lower right-hand corner is angle seven. And our last angle that we have in our top cluster is angle four. Now angle four is in the lower left or in the southwest. Another angle that is in the lower left or southwest is angle eight. There are four sets of corresponding angles in this drawing right here. Alternate interior angles. Now because it is using the word interior, that means that we really need to limit ourselves. We will only be allowed to look at the angles that are on the interior. So that's going to limit us down to three and four and five and six. So all those are the only choices that we will have. Now the other part of this is that we do need it to be alternate, which means opposite. So you want to reach across the transversal to the opposite side. So when we're gonna start with an angle like angle four, we wanna reach across and we're gonna find another angle like angle six. Angle four and angle six are both interior and alternate. Similar to that is angle three is an interior angle. And if we reach across the transversal, we'll find angle five. And that will be another set of alternate interiors. Next, alternate exteriors. Alternate exteriors means you are not allowed to use these angles in the middle. You are gonna have to focus on the angles that are very high up at the very top and very low down at the very bottom. And so we will only be using one and two and eight and seven. Now we will also be wanting to do alternates here. So that means that if we're interested in angle one, we wanna reach all the way down, but also across the transversal. And we're gonna be talking about angle seven. We're gonna be reaching across the whole drawing. Angle one and angle seven are alternate exterior. Similar to that is angle two is another exterior. And if we reach all the way down and all the way across the transversal, we will find angle eight, angle two and angle eight. Okay, pause the video and try the you try problem down here at the bottom on your own and then I'll share my answers for that one. Here are the answers for your last step. Angle three and angle nine are alternate interiors again. Five and 13 are corresponding. 
One and three are a particularly unique set. If you take a look, they are not located in two clusters like we had in the last example, but rather one and three are located in the same cluster. So that means that one and three are not corresponding or alternate interior or alternate exterior or even consecutives. They are going to be vertical angles. Your next job is going to be to work on your 3-1 practice worksheets.